Hey you guys, John Britt here. Hey, I'm gonna do another video. This I think is video number 28 in the free online glaze uh, series. Uh, I did one the other day and I thought I could proceed on to show you recipes and stuff, but <laughs> I forgot that there's a whole bunch more stuff. There's a ton of stuff. You know, I'm just doing the best I can here to give you an idea, sort of a beginner's basic idea of things. And then, you know, each one of these things is like a whole lifetime of work. So you can go as deep or as, as shallow as you want. I, I like to just know a little bit about everything because it sort of helps like inform all my work. So if, you know, if I'm working with a glaze and I encounter problems, uh, maybe cracking or shrink, too much shrinkage, then I can look and say, oh, maybe it's the kaolin in there. So once you know a bunch of this stuff and about the properties of them, then you can apply it to different things. Um, so I'm going to do the best I can here for about a half hour. I, I'm going to, I didn't even un set up this table. I have a, some books I'll show you that are good. Um, you can also get these books on interlibrary loan. A lot of them might be out of print, but al also today, you know, of course you can just Google stuff and, uh, you know, but once you know what to Google, like if you wanted to, you know, Google like flameware bodies, then you would at least know the terms and then you could start finding from there. Or you can go to books and find it that way and then get an interlibrary loan or, um, you know, see if people are, a lot of times people are selling their library collection uh, when they get out of pottery. All right, so today we're going to talk about clay bodies. So clay, flux, and filler. Um, I'll go through sort of each one of those things. It, it gets a little bit complicated, but I'm going to just do the best I can with the time I have. All right. Oh, and then what's going to happen is uh, next time I'll show you more uh, like a just like a recipe and talk about what's causing things in it. So low fire, mid range, high fire. Uh, and then after that, we'll go into uh, maybe wild clay stuff you find like at the creek bank and then how you can adjust that. So that'll involve stuff like, um, you know, ex uh, ex uh, absorption tests and uh, shrinkage bars and, and tests that you can run to help you figure out what you need to add to your clay to make it work. All right. So, as, as always, I'm alone here. And so it's a little bit of a weird, you know, video process, but I apologize for that, but that's the way life is. All right. So like I was saying with these, uh, these books, this book is an excellent book, Ceramic Science for the Potter. And it's by Lawrence and West. And so like in this, you would get, oh, let me see if I can get that. Okay, yeah. So like they, they'd have a thing on, a whole thing on whiteware bodies, or they might have a whole thing on thermal shock theory and firing and stuff. It's an excellent book. Um, and then I don't know where the other thing went, but there was a thing on, uh, um, Flameware bodies. And then this is the Tishane book, which is good too. You know, all these books have good things themselves. They talk about different fillers and uh, all kinds of stuff. So these are just really good things to get and look at and um, keep advancing your knowledge. All right. So we got clay bodies. So we got clay, flux, and filler. That's how you look at a clay body, as opposed to a glaze would be flux, refractory, and glass former. So if we talk about clay, without clay, your body won't have any plasticity. So clay and water make plasticity. But if it's too plastic, then like maybe you got too much ball clay, then you can get cracking and drying problems. So like just for an instance, a generalized, this is a g very general comment, like ball clay is generally 20 to 30% or you can run into problems. But I know that clays like B-Mix might have 50% ball clay and 50% plastic vitrox, something like that. And uh, so you just have to watch your drying when you have a, a 
high ball clay clay. Okay, so that's what that tells you is that when you're choosing the clay, uh, you have to consider the properties uh, if you're making your own clay body for plasticity, color, texture, etc. That was the whole video last time, number 27. All right, and then flux is, um, without our flux, we have no fired strength and low trans, uh, lucency. So you, if you just have clay in the recipe and no flux, it can, it, it can only center or, um, if you had a low fire clay in there, it could, it could flux it pretty well. Cause it, like you had uh Lizella in there, there's a lot of calcium. So that would help that melt. But generally speaking, you need to have some flux in a body to help it to fuse together. Uh, and so our main fluxes are going to be feldspars and fritz. I'll tell you a bit more about the, the fluxes when we get over to that area. All right. And then the filler. So clay flux and filler. So without filler, you have high shrinkage. So the filler particles help support the body. What that means is like there's grog in there. And then when the particles shrink and they, they'll, the grog makes like an architectural structure for the body. Um, so, but if you have another filler is silica, if you have that, that helps give you good expansion and contraction, uh, of the body, which helps with the gla glaze fit. So one of the critical things to know, and we'll talk about this a little is silica is uh, as a crystal has a high expansion and as a glass, it has a low expansion. So that is critical to know because when we melt silica so we have a body and we have silica in there as filler and then we he heat it to say let's say we heat it to cone nine and then uh, it's going to melt some of that silica fuse everything together uh, but if we heat it hotter we're going to melt more of it so we're going to change our expansion contraction to how much heat we add and how much silica is in there so okay in the crystal form uh Silica has a high expansion and that helps put glazes in compression and makes them stronger. So when a glaze is on a clay body and it crazes, it loses strength. But if it doesn't craze and it goes into compression, that get, makes it the strongest it can be for functional work. All right. So that's clay. So now we'll just start by going. We did the clays like two videos ago. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the flux. So the flux here, it's, it's like a glue. Uh, and without it, particles would only be centered together. Uh, and you'd only be getting the natural soluble fluxes from the clay. Um, flux gives hardness and density. So calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, etc., and then you may say, well, wh why does that matter? Well, because if you are doing, you, you want density if you're doing functional work. Uh, if the body's not po uh, porous, then the water won't leak in. That's a weird way to say it. So you want a vitrified clay body. So water won't leak. Bacteria won't grow. And it'll give strength for like the dishwasher and uh, banging it around and uh, dropping it, etc. But in sculptural bodies or architectural work, you don't really uh, you don't really need that density. Uh, you can even have a burnout bodies, uh, which are very porous, and uh, you can have uh, tons of grog in there to help support it. Uh, but if you're doing sculpture for outside, then yes, you do because you don't want freeze thaw stuff happening. Okay, so um, so when clay fires, it, it, the particles, when it uh, fires to peak temperature, they'll start to form glass and the particles get closer together. So that's called fired shrinkage. So you have shrinkage from clay early on and then you'll have fired shrinkage. And typical fluxes would be feldspar, fritz, Bone ash, whiting, dolomite, talc, gersley, and then borax and sodash. I'll sh I'll talk about each one of those sort of uh, here in a minute. All right. So then, if we're talking about a high temperature flux, we're going to use feldspar, 
Custer, Mahavar, Minspar. Now, just so you know, many of these uh, feldspars go in and out of production, so you have to be a little flexible. And, you know, and basically, it's what you're getting from your supplier. You know, it's also possible to use uh, spodumene and petalite for uh, flameware bodies. That's a, other, that's a lithium feldspar. So feldspars melt above cone six. Most feldspars start melting really well at cone nine, but uh, nephsi melts at cone six, and it's the lowest melting uh, feldspar. Uh, it's more powerful flux than custer because there's more soda and less silica. So it has a higher coefficient of expansion, so more uh, expansion contraction. Uh, and then at other temperatures, you're going to use talc. So you use talc at a low temperature because it forms eutectics. Although at higher temperatures, you can use it and you get some fusion. Uh, and you also use uh, low fire fritz uh, for, I'm sorry, and low fire bodies, you're going to use fritz like O4. Uh, and the good news about them is it's a synthetic formula. It's pre-fired. All the gases have been driven out, and uh, it's just a, you know, very uh, consistent product. Whereas feldspars are somewhat variable. All right, some advantages of feldspars. It's low cost. It's available everywhere. Uh, not too much iron in them. A lot of them are, um, they, they take all the iron out. Uh it's very viscous. So if you ever do a button test, you'll see that it just forms a little glass ball. Um, well, and the reason I say that is because unlike Fritz, which melt fast to liquid, feldspar melts slowly across a range. Uh, so that's good because you don't get as much warping uh, and over-firing. So in low-fire bodies, if you fire too hot, you can get warping with stuff. Whereas with feldspars, it's all happening uh, across a range of temperatures. And it slowly dissolves the filler and the clay, just like water at room temperature dissolves sugar. So it's a very slow process of uh, having this happen, which is uh, good for not having warping. All right, feldspar melts and forms glass, which is vitreous. It's okay. Uh, it's also insoluble in water generally. Now, so uh, nephsi is somewhat soluble, so you get some deflocculation with it. Uh, remember, all this stuff I'm telling you here is super generalized. So, you know, if you're a very specific person, you may have to go look stuff up on your own here because. Oh, we're just giving you an overview. All right, the disadvantages of feldspar, <laughs> which is not very many, because that's all we—that's the best thing we got. Is it's a high temperature flux generally, so you're stuck a little bit if you're doing low temperature, and it's not completely pure. But it's a very pure for um, most purposes. All right, then if you're going to use a frit as a flux, the advantages of that is it's uh, some somewhat soluble. It's not soluble, but it's not completely insoluble. Feldspars are more uh, insoluble than Fritz, uh, but this is somewhat insoluble. It's a very consistent formula. That's one great thing, and the gases are already boiled out. So that what that boiled is in quotes there. What that means is they heat it up, drive off carbon dioxide, and all the bubbles come out, and then uh, they put it in water and that uh, ma makes uh, shatters it and then they ball mill it and that's what a frit is so uh, that way you don't have as much trouble with pinholing and stuff and then some of the disadvantages of frit uh, is that the particles are heavy because they're like glass so they try to settle uh, and it needs silicon alumina but that's really not a Disadvantage, that's actually to me an advantage because you get a lot of fluxing and then you can make it go to whatever cone you want by adding aluminum and silica. All right, so that's our flux stuff. <laughs> well, no, we're not done with fluxes. Here's talc. So talc is three magnesium and four silica. 
It has a strong eutectic uh, with uh, other materials. So what that means, a eutectic is when you combine one or more material and it melts at a lower temperature than both individually. So eutectic is actually one of the magic things in, that makes ceramics possible. So talc has this eutectic with clay and it picks up alkali like sodium, potassium, and uh, uh, magnesium and um, helps it melt better. So there's not really too much glass. So glass is, we call it silica. Uh, and you get a clay body that's porous, but doesn't shrink as much. So meaning it doesn't flux to glass and it has a better glaze fit, doesn't craze as much. Um, so it, it can be used at two to four percent. It lowers maturation point one, two to three cones which is spectacular. So I guess this guy, Harold Bopp of Rookwood, suggested that 1% to 2% in an 8, 9 clay body would bring it down to cone 6. So that's a good little thing to know. Uh, so you just add a little bit of talc, and you can bring your body down, or you can make a cone 6 body and add a little talc to get it to, uh, to melt well. All right, so the disadvantages are talc has some asbestos-like particles. Uh, I think that happened up with Nitel. They had to stop production because they were making a clay body with uh, 50 talc, 50 ball clay. That was a white earthenware. Uh, and so, but you can find other types of talc. Uh, all right, and so then the, a, a recipe for a tile body would be 60 talc, 40 clay. All right, and then other minor fluxes are dolomite and whiting, gerstly, and you usually use whiting one to five percent, not too much, it's very powerful, calcium is a very powerful flux. And then gerstly, bone ash for bone china, soda ash and borax for self-glazing clays. Now I'll show you some samples next time of what these look like. And then... Um, Oh yeah, so if you have soluble oxides, that interferes with plasticity, it means it kind of deflocculates the body. So if you have soda ash in your clay body to make a self-glazing clay, it can make it thixotropic and really not, not hard to work with. All right, so lithium carb also can be used, but, uh, but very seldom. It's, it's a two, uh, I'm sorry, lithium carb, lithium is used very seldomly for, uh, Flameware bodies, but uh, they don't really use lithium carb very often. They try to put it in a feldspar. Uh, so, oh, and then this is a recipe for bone china, like 50 bone ash, 25 custer, 25 EPK. So uh, they also use uh, natural bone ash can uh, not be calcined well, and so you can have... Uh, organic material in there which can start to smell over time so a lot of times pe when people you do this they'll use tricalcium phosphate tcp is synthetic bone ash all right that was a load of stuff <laughs> but wait there's more I'm trying to get this in in 30 minutes so all right so for our clay flux and filler we did clay we did flux now we're on filler so a common filler is going to be sand, which is like rounded particles, although some can be angular. Um, and then grog, which are angular particles, and they, uh, they won't shrink because usually they've been fired before they sell it to you. Another filler is pyrophyllite, also known as pyrax or pyrotrol. It, the formula is Al2O3, uh, 4SiO2. It's an aluminum material with extra silica, really. And it's often used in porcelain clay bodies to cut shrinkage, and it, but it can make it less translucent because a lot of times with porcelain bodies, what you're after is translucency. Another um, filler is going to be molite, which is 3Al2O3, 2SiO2. That naturally develops in the firing. So it forms needle-like crystals that can uh, knit the clay together and give it strength and make it more refractory. It can also be introduced in a clay body as molochite. All right, so 
I told you the bit about silica being uh, as a crystal state being a high expansion and in the glass state it's low expansion uh, now here's a formula for how mollite is formed you have th three clay particles kaolin and then you it'll restructure during the firing to form mollite and it'll eject for silica that's molecular silica that's very small and it's often referred to as free silica uh, and if that's heated very long over, uh, like cone six, uh, it can form cristobalite. So the key thing about this is when you have silica or quartz in a, uh, when it's heated up, it has a one to two percent expansion at 1063 Fahrenheit. And so, uh, when you heat up silica that has formed into cristobalite, it has a 3% contraction at 450 degrees. So the reason that's important is if you're making dinnerware, which you'd heat an oven up to like cook your lasagna in a baking dish, that may go to 475. And if you have cristobalite in there, you might get some cracking at that temperature. If you did sc sculptural stuff, you wouldn't really have to worry. But... Uh, the thing about cristobalite is it's not going to form at cone 6 because we're not above this temperature for 3 to 4 hours. If I have 20% feldspar in my re uh, recipe, so that would be like all porcelains will not have any cristobalite. And the really, most people who make clay bodies know about this, and so they put some feldspar in there to melt. But the people who occasionally will have trouble with cristobalite is wood fire people because they will fire for seven days and they'll just hold the temperature. And that anytime you have free silica ejected and you're holding something above these temperatures for a long time, you can change that silica to cristobalite. All right, I hope I said all that right. Okay, another filler is going to be alumina. So that's sometimes they'll put one or two percent alumina in a porcelain that give it strength. Grog adds uh, strength to the body. Calcine kaolin is another um, filler. And then the uh, other weird fillers are sawdust, paper, nylon fibers, which are actually pretty bad because they can form cyanide gas. But people also use fiberglass as filler. Uh, vermiculite, perlite. And another one is wollastonite. I'll show you a recipe next time on uh, wollastonite uh, talc body for low fire. And this is, uh, it's, it's elongated fibers that cut shrinkage. Um, and they develop strength in the body. And uh, it's right in between like a flux and a filler because it's calcium and silica. All right, so we might have made that. Uh, just so you know, the types of there's a lot of types of clay bodies. All you have to do is go to a catalog of Laguna or uh, whoever your clay supplier is and look at the bodies, Miller, look at the bodies and uh, high water, and you'll see like they have there, one type of clay is bone china, porcelain, raku, ovenware. So that's just like cookware. Flameware goes directly on the flame. And then you have clay bodies uh, that you make specifically for salt firing. So you get the orange peel effect and flashing. And then there's also soda clay bodies, wood fired bodies, self glazing clay bodies, earthenware, throw, and then bodies that are designed for throwing. So they're very plastic to throw with. And then hand building bodies. Sometimes you want them very plastic and other times you want some grogs in there to uh, to withstand, you know, the weird stuff, your, you know, angles that you're making with hand building. And then sculptural body. So that might be a body with a lot of grog or it could be with burnout material. So if you want it lighter than, uh, you know, if it's going to be two inches, three inches thick, you may want to add some uh, perlite or some... Uh, sawdust to help it to lighten up and then you can also make all kinds of colored clay bodies which can be you know a lot of times there's porcelain 
slip casting bodies. I didn't even write that on there. Uh, you can have no shrinkage sculpture bodies. And you can uh, have burnout bodies. All right. So I think I did everything there, miraculously. Hope it was interesting for you and uh, educational. And uh, you want to go read a hundred books by next time. <laughs> and here's where my uh, channel is. You're probably on it, so you don't need to know that. All right, we'll see you next time.